Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patty Schrader. I'm with the Iowa Association of School Boards, and I am one of the members of the finance support team. Just a few housekeeping rules as we get going. One, you should uh, all see that you have a question screen on the right-hand side, and if you have a question at any time during this uh, webinar, you certainly should write those questions, type those questions in, and we will attempt to answer them the best we can. The other thing I would tell you is after this presentation and webinar is finished, we will post that on our, the Iowa Association of School Boards homepage, and then over time it will uh, will transfer it back to the finance page, but still on the Iowa Association of School Boards website. Here with me today to actually give the webinar is Ron Peeler, and he is with Allers Law Firm, and he has about almost, what, a thir 30 years worth of experience in, in, yeah, in school law. So he's just the right person to talk about this particular topic. So without further ado, and uh, we would like to have Ron start with shedding some light on solar power contract issues. Thanks, Ron. All right, well, thank you. Um, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, solar power contracts. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some developments that have uh, happened recently that uh, has produced more interest in uh, use of solar power for our, our school clients uh, and, and school districts around the state. Uh, and we're also going to talk about some of the things that, uh, that you as school board members, uh, superintendents, school business officials, uh, things that you'll need to be thinking about when you're faced with these possibilities. Um, we won't have a lot of clear answers for you today on very specific questions. What this is more about is how to approach the issue. It's about how to look at uh, the, the, the documents that you're uh, being presented with so that you can figure out step by step, are we going down the path that we can go down as a school district, or are we heading into some uh, some territory that that may have some some legal questions, legal problems with it? So we're going to shed some light on um, some of the uh, different issues uh, that you'll be seeing. Somebody's going to shed some light for me on how to run the. Uh, there we go on how to run the PowerPoint. Um, so what is it that uh, has happened uh, recently that has led us to, to see more proposals? We had a Supreme Court decision uh, about a year ago now, Iowa Supreme Court decision in a case called SE Enterprises doing business as Eagle Point uh, versus the Iowa Utilities Board. And this was a case that uh, came out of Dubuque. The city had uh, entered into an agreement with a, uh, uh, a local well, uh, provider company, SE Enterprises. And what SE Enterprises was going to do is put some solar generation equipment behind the district's meter. That means that the equipment was being designed to provide for the needs of that building, um, not being designed or sized to create a whole lot of extra power, but if there was a little bit of power, then the intent uh, extra created, the intent was then that, that power could go back uh, into the system. But it's really being installed behind the meter as if it were a generation equipment just for that city building. Um, and the, the unique nature of it, though, was that the question came forward, um, is it... Uh, did this situation create an improper competition with the regular utility uh, who has a certain territory that, that by Iowa uh, law and rules, the, the regular utilities have territories uh, where they provide the service? Um, was this third party coming in and in essence creating and selling power to the city behind the meter in effect improperly competing with that utility, uh, did, did this third party become a, another utility that would, uh, uh, in essence, make it so that they could not be operating? So that was the question. Uh, it was first structured as a power purchase agreement whereby this third party uh, group owned the equipment, sold the power 
to this uh, to the city, and it was that act of selling the power that the uh, the the utility going before the utilities board and ultimately then the utilities Iowa Utilities Board determined that that was creating a utility that was in improper competition with the uh, uh, with the regular utility for the area. The question went on up to the Iowa Supreme Court and the Iowa Supreme Court took a different view. The Iowa Supreme Court decided that uh, what was happening here in that situation was not um, was not one where you had uh, the creation of a public utility, even though that uh, that third party was selling power, they were really only selling the power to the to the one customer to the to the city, and the Iowa Supreme Court said that that does not create a utility that would violate the exclusive territory of the primary utility for the area. So, what's the takeaway from that case? The takeaway from that case is that the Iowa Supreme Court said. It is not improper for third parties to come in, place equipment behind the meter of a, um, of a government entity, sell power to that government entity. That does not create improper competition. That is really uh, what the courts viewed it as something similar to installing a, a, a high efficiency uh, uh, HVAC system or some other uh, mechanism that a customer uses to cut down their regular usage from the uh, from the primary utility. So once that case came out and it gave a green light to at least from a utility law standpoint, it gave a green light to the creation of uh, of these new types of arrangements uh, with government bodies and. That's where we're seeing now some uh, some ideas, some propositions coming forward for for school districts. But as a school district, school districts do not have home rule power like some of our other governmental entities do in Iowa. Home rule power means that you have, uh, as an entity, you can make decisions for yourself if the statutes don't prohibit you from doing it you can do it. Schools in Iowa are the opposite of that. We, we operate under what's called Dillon's Rule. Uh, under Dillon's Rule, a school district in Iowa only has those powers that are um, expressly granted in our statutes or necessarily implied by our governing statutes. So if, uh, if there's something that a school district would like to do by way of creating a contract, by way of, of uh, taking some action, uh, instead of looking for something that prohibits that in the law, we have to find something that says we can do it. Um, the, the way the law is developed under Dillon's rules as a school, we can't do indirectly uh, something that we don't have the power to do directly. And the, the courts tend to look at our, our statutes that give schools powers narrowly uh, and, and, and read them narrowly to limit the powers to the precise language of a statute. So to, uh, to summarize what we have here with regard to Dillon's rule, we have to find something in the statute that either expressly says we can take a certain action or by necessary implication of the powers granted uh, supports our taking that action. And we have to look at that with regard to these, uh, uh, the different proposals that might be coming forward uh, uh, with re relationship to solar power because the, the different proposals that you will receive are going to have a variety of, of uh, um, conditions in them. And you're going to have to look at each one of those conditions, each one of the obligations that the district may be taking on uh, under these proposals to determine, do we have the authority to, uh, um, to enter into this agreement? First and foremost is, what kind of agreement are we looking at here? As a district, um, uh, we have a general power to contract, but we have limited powers with regard to issuing debt. 
is the proposal that's being put before the school district um, creating a debt? Uh, are we obliging the school district to be paying for uh, uh, something over time, over the course of more than a year, to the point that we really need to look at our uh, our borrowing statutes, our statutes relating to uh, borrowing from uh, our PEPL resources or our sales tax proposals uh, or sales tax resources? Uh, does the contract that we're looking at, instead of creating a debt, does it uh, provide for a lease? We have certain authorities that we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, uh, and, and we'll have some information on the PowerPoint from that with regard to what powers a district has to enter into a lease of equipment. Um, is, it a, uh, uh, is it a purchase? Uh, is it an outright purchase? We have, uh, uh, we need to find where we have authority to make the purchase. And it's not just looking for the authority to take the action, but it's also looking at what kind of funds, how, what, what funds do we use to pay for the, uh, um, the different aspects of the, the contract. Um, again, we'll get into a little more detail on a, a future slide here, but we have, uh, schools have different funds that, that uh, the statutes provide very specific uses for that fund. We have the management fund. We have our general fund. We have our capital projects funds, uh, our sales tax and PEPL funds. Um, and each of those funds have very specific ways that they can be used. And these, uh, these solar contract proposals can get a little jumbled as to what, um, as to determining what it is you're paying for and therefore determining what funds can we legally use for, uh, uh, for making that payment. We also need to look at our powers and our restrictions with regard to competitive bidding. Uh, if we have a public improvement that we are uh, uh, contracting for and it's over the, uh, the statutory minimum for competitive quotes or competitive bids, we have to follow that process, and that means determining are we really leasing the equipment or are we purchasing the equipment? And if we're purchasing it, the, uh, the uh, installation of equipment, that can, uh, can uh, implicate competitive bidding. There's also things that you'll need to think about, and I won't cover this very much in this uh, 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 presentation here today, but your relationship with your current utility. Uh, once this, uh, uh, once you have solar power equipment in, installed at one of your facilities, you're going to need to have and be working with your utility on what's called an interconnect agreement. And there, there may be certain provisions and certain promises that you have to be making in that process that you'll need to be aware of, and you should be checking that out before you enter into any agreement with regard to uh, uh, the, the the solar power. Uh, equipment. So those are some of the reasons, some of the areas we'll talk about in more detail here as to um, why, why it's important in essence what you'll need to be doing with your, uh, with your counsel, uh, your legal counsel, is dissecting whatever proposal you receive, determining what it really provides for, and, uh, and then taking action uh, based on how it is that the uh, the, the contract is, has, has been uh, construed. So here are some of the different authorities that we have under statutes uh, that will uh, come into play when you're looking at the possibility of obtaining solar power generation equipment. The first one is uh, PEPL, to, uh, Section 298.3 of the Iowa Code. The authorities that schools have under PEPL are we can purchase equipment, we can lease equipment, we can lease purchase equipment, um, and we can do the lease purchase if it's um, in a transaction for the equipment exceeding $500. Um, the, we can use our PEPL authority for school improvements, uh, so if you Putting, on a, putting in a new furnace, uh, putting in a new boiler, 
um, putting in solar equipment. Uh, we could uh, uh, we can use our PEPL revenue for that. <coughs> Excuse me. We can also use our PEPL revenue by statute for energy conservation expenditures. There's also a little little used. I'm not sure I've ever seen it used. Um, option for using uh, PEPL for a lease purchase option agreements for uh, for a school building. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, again, not a very uh, uh, commonly used provision. If you want to borrow against your PEPL, uh, the voted PEPL, you can borrow against that by issuing capital loan notes. The voted PEPL goes into place for a maximum of, of 10 years. So if you, as a district, have your voters authorize the $1.34 voted PEPL, you can only borrow against the uh, property tax portion of the voted PEPL. So let's say you do it uh, uh, all property tax and no income surtax. Um, you can then anticipate that money, bring it all forward by borrowing against it uh, for the whole 10 years uh, if you go borrow right after the voted PEPL has been passed. Um, that is one way to get money for your district to, uh, um, to purchase uh, the, uh, the, the, the PEPL or the, the solar equipment. So that's one funding source is look to your PEPL revenue and, and use the PEPL revenue if we're, in essence, looking at purchasing, leasing, or lease purchasing the equipment here, or paying for the installation of the, uh, uh, the solar equipment in, in our school building. You can also use our sales tax revenues. Sales tax revenues under Chapter 423 E and F of the Iowa Code can be used for those PEPL purposes that we just talked about if the district has in place a, uh, a valid revenue purpose statement. And this is a side note, but if your district has not adopted a district-wide revenue purpose statement since uh, 2009 when we switched, or 2008 when we switched to the, uh, uh, the statewide penny, you, you need to be doing that especially if you're going to be consider, uh, considering using your uh, uh, sales tax revenue for, a, uh, uh, for any purpose that you're going to borrow against. You can borrow against your sales tax revenue out through uh, the ex expiration of the tax, December 31, 2029, by issuing sales tax bonds. So um, that's another way of finding revenues to pay for the purchase, lease, or lease purchase of solar equipment is through your, uh, through your sales tax revenues on hand and through borrowing against sales tax if that's what you are looking to do. General fund in, uh, in Iowa is another fund that we have uh, that, that is going to be implicated um, in this process. Uh, under statute, our general fund is what we pay for, we use to pay for all other expenditures not otherwise accounted for from another fund. So it's pretty broad uh, uh, use of the fund, but what that means is, is if another fund specifically lists an expenditure from that fund, you can't use your general fund to pay for it unless there's another statute that uh, specifically allows you to use the general fund to pay for it. Purchasing of power. If you are paying for power, um, you would make that payment under the general fund. Um, that, that would be the, uh, um, well, another one. Maintenance uh, with regard to uh, to, to use of PEPL, we can use our PEPL for um, reconstructing, repairing, but we can't use it for maintaining equipment. So a, a maintenance payment is very clear. The DE has taken, I think, a very clear position that uh, maintenance payments need to be paid out of the general fund. Um, there's very limited authority to borrow against the general fund. We can do some equipment notes against the general fund uh, to buy equipment. 
but uh, uh, but generally the general fund is used for your operating expenses, day-to-day -day expenses as we go, uh, uh, as you operate your districts. All right, um, installment purchase contracts. I, I put this in here because um, a the types of contracts that we might enter into in our own private business are not necessarily going to be contracts that uh, 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 a district can enter into. Uh, an installment purchase contract, what I'm looking at that, uh, when I say that, is it's, uh, I'm thinking of something different from a lease, lease purchase because you're not leasing it on your way to a purchase, what you're doing, as I look at an installment purchase contract, is you're making payments over time in order to get to the end when you uh, uh, make your final payment and and own the uh, the equipment. It would be more like uh, uh, buying a car. You make your payments over time. At the end, you own the car. Um, it's a form of debt. You are agreeing up front to make the payments. Um, and unless we can fit whatever installment process, the uh, payment process that you're looking at doing, unless it's constructed as a capital loan note from your vote to Pebble, unless it's sales tax bonds from your sales tax revenue, or unless it's a lease purchase uh, of, um, uh, of the equipment uh, from either your Pebble or your sales tax, or an equipment note from the general fund. If it doesn't fit one of those four types of structures, any kind of payments that you're making over time to ultimately own the equipment, it will not be authorized. So you need to look carefully at the structure. If you're trying to fit it within the lease purchase structure, you need to make sure that it's it's drawn up and uh, uh, and and is actually in fact a lease purchase. Um, if you're going to be doing any of these other notes, you're going to be involving uh, note counsel or bond counsel. You're going to be uh, needing to go through an even more uh, um, uh, intense paper process of getting the proper authorizations in place. Uh, you would likely even be involving a financial advisor or some other uh, um, financial representative in the process. So you, you don't accidentally issue capital loan notes or sales tax bonds. It's a very uh, uh, clear process that you would go through. So we, we've, we've covered all that uh, by way of background to get at what, uh, to, to have as background as, as you look at what is in front of us with regard to a proposal from either a third-party investment group, from a, a solar uh, um, a sales con, uh, uh, representative, uh, to, to basically determine what it is that we are we have before us. So let's we can start with some of the easy ones. I'm just going to get these out of the way before I talk about principles of contract construction. If you're looking at purchasing outright the equipment. Um, uh, you can um, go th uh, do that, and we've had uh, uh, a, a couple of our clients do that by issuing sales tax bonds. And in essence, what you do is you go through the process of issuing the sales tax bonds. You get the money, and you pay for the uh, the installation of the equipment, just like you would if you were building an addition onto your school, just like you would if you were building a uh, uh, a new athletic facility. You, you go about it that way. In that process, the district owns the equipment. Um, the, uh, the district is responsible for its upkeep. There really is nobody that you're paying for power because you've purchased, you own outright the equipment that you are, uh, um, you are getting. That is probably not going to be, uh, you, you will, you'll still need to be, uh, have your, your legal counsel involved and you'll need to have bond counsel involved if you're doing that kind of a purchase through capital loan notes or sales tax. But those aren't really the types of, uh, of, of situations that I'm looking at here with regard to contract construction. 
this is more the unique type of situation where you're, you see a proposal coming at you where you have a third party group who's going to own the equipment for a while. After so many years, they, uh, um, uh, they, they, there's an uh, option or a mandatory purchase of the equipment by the district uh, during the time of, uh, uh, of that operation. There's either a lease of the equipment by the district or the district is purchasing the power during that time. Um, those kind of uh, proposals that might be coming your way, that's what I'm talking about here when I, when I bring up the, the idea of contract construction. Contract construction is looking at a document not necessarily to interpret the words but to interpret the legal effect uh, of, of the document. Um, what, what we're looking at is we're looking at what are, how does the law apply to the words that are, are being said. And uh, um, there are certain principles with regard to contract construction that I, I think will be important for you to keep in mind. Uh, primary one is it's the overall language of the agreement and it's not what uh, um, what a heading is called. It's not how the agreement is titled. It's the overall nature of it that, that determines what the legal character of the document is. So I might title a document and say this is a document to sell you a duck. But if I go through that document, everything I describe in that document describes a snake and not a duck, you are buying a snake. You need to look at what is in the contract and what is being provided in order to determine what it is that, uh, that you are getting and, and how it is that you can legally um, do what it is that you're being asked to do. So we look at the entire agreement. We don't just look at uh, individual uh, parts. We look at um, not necessarily where the, the clauses are positioned. We look at everything as a whole. Courts also, when they look at contract construction, they look at the relationship of the parties, what was said in negotiation, uh, what might be common trade practices uh, in an area, and they do all of this to try to reach a result that's fair, and reasonable, and not absurd. And so, to issue spot, it's a, a proposal that your district uh, uh, could be looking at with regard to uh, solar power. Does the agreement provide for the purchase of power? That's one of the first things I would suggest that you look at. And that's what, going back to the SZ case, that is what the, uh, the Iowa Supreme Court was looking at. The Iowa Supreme Court was looking at a proposal that was um, a third party owning the equipment and that third party for so many years selling power at X kilowatt, uh, X amount per kilowatt hour, um, just like you might pay to a utility, um, that, uh, that was what was in the SE case. So you may be seeing some proposals come at you like that. And if you have a, a proposal that comes at you that says we, uh, the, the equipment will be owned by a third party and the district will pay so many cents per kilowatt hour uh, for, for the power that's, uh, um, that's consumed, that portion of the contract sure would look to me like a purchase of power. It would look like you are, uh, uh, and, and being a purchase of power, you would need to use your general fund for that. So if your district's um, needs financial needs are such that you want to lessen the burden on the general fund, which is what many of our school districts are trying to do around the state. Um, you would need to recognize in an agreement like this that you still are going to have certain costs that are going to have to come out of your general fund. That purchase of power, as long as you are purchasing power, has to come out of the general fund. Now contrast that with a provision that might be in one of these proposals that, that says you will pay X amount per month for the, uh, the right to use the equipment and all of the uh, uh, power that it generates. 
uh, a, a proposal like that to me, and we don't have court review on it yet, but what I, why I would caution, uh, caution you with regard to this language, those kind of proposals start looking more like you are not buying power, but you are making a payment for the use of the equipment. Um, you, you, you are making that payment in, in, in the hypothetical example I'm using here. You're making that payment based upon not upon the power generated, but upon the use of the equipment. That sounds like a lease to me. Um, the uh, um, what, so uh, you need to keep that in mind because a lease of the equipment cannot be paid out of general fund. A lease of the equipment is paid for out of your PEPL fund or your sales tax fund. The uh, with regard to that. Uh, flat payment, the, again, what I just mentioned, the district is taking the financial risk here that it doesn't produce uh, any energy uh, or produces little energy. So we have uh, uh, a month of full rain or we, it, for some reason, the equipment goes offline and for that month you don't generate any power so you're still paying the utility to bring your power in uh, from the, the regular utility you're taking that financial risk here. That to me looks like you're, you're leasing the equipment. Um, does the agreement require the equipment to be purchased or does it provide for an option? Uh, the reason I have some concerns from a legal standpoint that you should be v uh, visiting with your legal counsel about on a requirement to purchase is that that starts looking like an installment purchase agreement. You're making your payments over time, your monthly payments, but you are right now up front agreeing to make a purchase. It might be five years from now, it might be six years from now, 10 years from now, but you are signing a contract right now obliging you to make a purchase at a set price at a certain time of that equipment. Certainly starts to look more like you're buying the equipment and you're making monthly payments to own the equipment than it does uh, um, uh, looking like you are buying power. Um, however, contrast that with an option to purchase that is truly at, it is at then market value, uh, fair market value. So you're not valuing the equipment right now based upon whatever the third party group thinks they need to receive to, to make enough money on the deal but uh, uh, based on their investment, but you are renting it, renting the equipment for the next five years in, in a hypothetical example here. You would rent it for the next five years with an option to buy it at fair market value. Um, that looks less like an installment purchase and, uh, um, and looks more like a true lease. So you need to look at that aspect of the contract. What's our obligations to, uh, to own or purchase the agreement? Because um, that will then impact whether or not this, these, this is an agreement that the district can legally enter into. Is there a maintenance payment in the agreement? So I said before that the, the Department of Ed has been pretty clear in their interpretation of our, our Iowa laws with regard to the authority to pay for maintenance of equipment, that comes out of the general fund. So if there's a provision that says uh, um, you're going to lease the solar equipment for the next five years, but as the district, you're gonna pay a maintenance fee per month to, to a certain entity to make sure that that equipment is maintained, you're gonna need to have those prices separately stated so that you can account for the lease of equipment out of your PEPL fund or sales tax fund and account for the maintenance of the equipment out of your general fund. Talk a little bit more right now about competitive bidding. Competitive bidding is required for our um, public improvements, in quotes, over $135,000. Uh, a, a public improvement is construction work which is constructed under the control of the government entity and paid for with government funds. Um, 
just like if you were installing an HVAC system or a boiler in a building, um, I think it, a, a strong argument can be made that installing this solar equipment in your um, uh, for your building is a uh, is the installation of a fixture. And so, if the cost is going to be over one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, you would need to competitively bid it. Let's take the easy example. You're not going with a third-party uh, provider of the equipment, but you're, you're just going out to the marketplace. You're going to buy the solar equipment. You're going to install it, have it installed um, uh, in your building, just like you would do if you were doing that with a boiler. You would need to go out for competitive bids. Uh, you would need to follow the uh, uh, contracting process uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the value of the installed equipment, the cost of it is over $135,000. Lease purchasing. Um, lease purchasing is not something that mixes well with competitive bidding because in a lease purchase, you're just leasing the equipment up until the time that you own the equipment. Um, and if it's a true lease purchase, you're, uh, um, you're, you're paying for that equipment over time, but there, there's not really a, a construction element that goes along with it. Usually what, when, when we've used lease purchase of, of equipment, we've used them for technology equipment like laptops, we've used them for buses, they, they, they aren't used for things that become fixtures or part of the, the building. We do have a provision uh, uh, in the law that does allow schools uh, to lease purchase a school building, lease purchase something that is already constructed. However, that, the only way you can exercise that authority is with a 60% vote of the public. Um, and I've, I've put that information on the slide here. Generally, lease purchasing doesn't work with, uh, with competitive bidding because in competitive bidding uh, of, a, of a public improvement, we, are, we need to have retainage, we need to hold money back so that we can uh, um, settle up with claims uh, for subcontractors. And in a lease purchase structure, you're not you're not making those kind of payments. You're just making progress payments toward the ownership. So in general, the, the lease purchase authority that we have for under PEPL and then under sales tax, while it works well for obtaining equipment, it does not work for obtaining a fixture that's installed on your building. So uh, if you're looking at a proposal that uh, purports to be a lease purchase of the installed equipment on your school district uh, property, that would be something that I would suggest you have carefully reviewed with legal counsel to determine uh, um, what the true nature of the agreement is, the true nature of the proposal. So some of the takeaway points, and then it will, we'll have some time here at the end if you want to uh, ask questions, or if not, maybe I'll make up a few questions and just talk about them for a while. Um, uh, and by the way, asking the questions, I, I believe it's been explained, you just type it into the, the box on your screen, it'll pop up here, and then I'll, uh, I'll do my best to answer them uh, as I can. But some of the takeaway points. Uh, look at your agreements, look at the proposals, and if it's truly a power purchase agreement, the type of agreement that was being looked at in the SZ case, um, in that type of agreement, the third party retains the ownership uh, of the equipment. So as a district up front in a, in a power purchase agreement, you're not buying anything by way of equipment, you're buying the power. Um, in that situation, you pay for your power out of the general fund. If you want it to be a true power purchase agreement where you are just paying for the power out of the general fund, you can have a purchase option, but it needs to be an option. A required purchase starts looking like a purchase of installed equipment, which, which creates those uh, uh, issues related to competitive bidding and, uh, and creation of debt. 
Um, so if it's a power purchase agreement with a purchase option, that option should be at fair market value, not at a set price. Um, and it should be payable from your, uh, the purchase option could then be payable if you choose to accept the, the option from your sales tax fund or your PEPL fund. Um, at that point, uh, when the district would exercise an option to purchase, I think a good argument can be made that competitive bidding would not apply because at that point you are not um, undergoing a public improvement. You already have equipment that's been installed. You've been paying for the power on that equipment. What you're looking at doing is purchasing installed equipment. It's like purchasing a portion of a building. And we don't need to go through competitive bidding when we are purchasing a portion of a building. Uh, we only do the competitive building, or bidding when we are uh, doing a, a public improvement construction project. So I think you can make an argument that at that point, even if the equipment after five years is worth half a million dollars, um, and that's the fair market value, and, and a school district decides to accept that option, I don't think there needs to be any uh, competitive bidding that you would do. However, if you don't choose, if you choose not to exercise that option, the owner of the equipment would need to come in and remove it. Um, so if that option to purchase is not exercised, then the equipment would be removed by the uh, by the third party. So that's what a power purchase agreement, a true full power purchase agreement, would look like. Okay, we have a question. Let me see here now. All right, so the question we have here is, okay, does the district have the legal authority to enter into a joint project with other government entities which would establish a facility not located on school property and not for the exclusive use of the school? I assume a school district can only invest in facilities for its exclusive use. Um, that question has been looked at by uh, um, an individual in our office uh, and along with me. I don't believe we do. The, the, I'll give you an example of what I believe the, the, the um, participant is, is referring to. Could, could a school district, a city, a county uh, come together and basically create a solar farm that produces electricity that would then be uh, routed into a system and the electricity that produced by that system would be apportioned off to each of the, the, uh, uh, the entities um, such that the, the, the electricity generated out there would be credited back to the, to the, uh, the different entities' usage at other buildings. The problem with that is, is that it's not, you're, you're not investing in the equipment to directly produce anything for your, uh, your facility. It's not like having a boiler that produces the heat, the hot air that is uh, uh, then used in your, your facility. Um, I think it would be argued that the, uh, the, the, the district would be investing in a utility, <laughs> in essence. You would be putting your money into this generation facility and, uh, um, and, and then receive it. It'd be, be like investing in a utility. That's the, the, the best way I can say it. And that's not a, an approved investment uh, in Iowa for school district funds. So what that means, though, is that uh, unless we can get a change in the law or something that would allow that to happen, we're really only looking at generating uh, so the type of solar equipment that can generate the energy for to be used at a specific campus. Uh, you, you're, you're putting it in behind that meter for that campus, and we're not looking at these larger scale, which may be more uh, uh, efficient, but we're not looking at these larger scale projects. We have another question. Or this is a... Yeah, it's, it's a follow-up here. I have the scenario correct. Okay, if the option to purchase is not exercised at the end of the peep, uh, power purchase agreement, 
Can the power purchase agreement be uh, renegotiated or renewed? I would think yes. So if you have a, a five-year power purchase agreement, at the end of that five years, there could be renegotiation on how much you're going to pay for the power. Um, there, there, there could be uh, 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 other, other terms that would be varied. Anything that's renegotiated would still need to fit within the district's legal authorities. Um, but I think the key is, is that if there is not another uh, agreement negotiated or reached, then you part your ways, which means the equipment parts its way from your facility. Um, so if you can't come to an agreement, it's going to, uh, 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 you're, you're going to need to have the solar equipment removed. Can a school, there's another question. Can a school district enter into, enter into an LLC, a limited liability corporation, for the purpose of installing energy equipment and providing investors with available tax credits. Um, uh, districts cannot form an LLC to my knowledge, uh, if I'm understanding the question. Um, and school districts don't pay taxes, so we don't take, uh, uh, we, we don't get the benefit of, of the uh, the income tax credits, uh, but uh, you know what we're looking at here in, in, in this process is not the the school district creating any new entity, um, but the the school district contracting with an entity, and whether that entity that we uh, that the school district contracts with is entitled to take the tax credits or not. Um, we have this in a later slide, but I'll go ahead and just. Uh, touch on it now, um, that shouldn't be the district's issue. Um, the, the, the district needs to analyze its obligations under any agreement based upon what its powers are and what makes financial sense for the district, whether or not a third party group can uh, ultimately uh, claim the tax credits or not needs to be something that that group works out with its legal advisors and uh, um, uh, and that's just part of their the, the risk that they take. Another question, can nonprofits enter into a third party PPA? Um, I don't know of any reason why a school district cannot contract with a provider to be a, uh, or a to, to purchase power. Um, that is, uh, um, so I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm fully understanding that question. If, if you're looking at can nonprofits be the third party PPA provider, um, that question I don't know. Um, but where the question, since the question reads, can nonprofits enter into a third party PPA? I guess what I can tell you is I believe a school district has the authority to, uh, uh, to do so. All right, uh, let's, let's see here. Does the power purchase agreement qualify for net metering in view of the recent Supreme Court ruling? Um, that is going to be a question that I would want to have. Uh, I think every school district needs to work out, if you're going to do a power purchase agreement, you need to work out with your utility provider as part of the interconnect agreement. The net metering that's uh, that being asked here or referenced in this question is when a, uh, let, let's say I, uh, I'm a farmer. I have a, uh, uh, a, a stock facility, an animal facility that I'm going to use solar power for my electricity that I need for that facility. And I put a, a, a solar power up. I, I have an agreement with the utility that says if I produce excess power on a certain day, they will take that back through the meter and then they will net that off of my bill for any power I consume from them, okay? Um, there are 
the, the, the utilities are still looking, I think, and, and figuring out the fallout from the SZ case. Um, the rules need to be looked at carefully and discussed with your provider as to whether they will agree to the interconnect agreement in a pure power purchase arrangement. Because in a pure power purchase arrangement, the district is not owning or leasing the equipment. The district is just buying the power. And the utilities may take a different position on that than they would if the school district were leasing the equipment. If the district is leasing the equipment, then there may, the, uh, the utility provider may indicate that they will do the net metering and do the interconnect. However, if it's a pure power purchase agreement and not a lease of the equipment, the, uh, the utility may not. So that's not really an element of the Supreme Court ruling. The Supreme Court ruling was more along the lines of, does a power purchase agreement violate the utility's exclusive territory? The court said no. But this is one of those fallout questions with regard to net metering that, that is going to have to be addressed. Okay. Going back to the slides. So takeaway points. General fund, we use that. So if we're in a power purchase arrangement where we're buying the power, we're not leasing the equipment, we are paying for the power, that, that payment for power, the maintenance of the equipment comes out of the general fund. We can use our PEPL or sales tax if we're leasing the equipment, um, if we're lease purchasing the equipment, um, which, as I've said, is, is going to be somewhat difficult, um, but, uh, but PEPL sales tax can be used for lease purchase and it can be used for the construction and installation costs of the equipment. It, another takeaway point is if we are purchasing the equipment and if it's going to be over $135,000, um, the uh, uh, competitive bidding is, uh, is implicated. But if it's a lease of the equipment, competitive bidding would not be implicated. Um, Installment purchase contracts, if you're, if you're presented with a contract that says make a payment of $5,000 a month for 60 months and then make a payment of $500,000 and you own the equipment, looks like an installment purchase contract, that's going to have some legal issues on it. Any, any payments that you make over time need to fit within the, uh, um, uh, our authorized ways to borrow money. It has to be a capital loan note, sales tax bonds, equipment notes. Um, uh, or just a lease purchase of equipment, not lease purchase of installed equipment, but lease purchase of equipment. Um, the construction work cannot be lease purchased unless we have that 60% vote, which is not something that's going to be very common. So what should you be doing when you're in these situations? First and foremost, I think a question to ask yourself is, have we contacted our attorney? This is a brand new area, folks. And uh, um, we're, still, we're still trying to figure out all the answers here. And, and there's enough involved, enough questions involved here where I believe having your legal counsel involved up front is, is going to be a, a, a very wise thing for you to do. We need to be looking at the structure of the, of the proposed agreement. So. Do we have a power purchase agreement? Do we have a lease purchase that's been proposed here? Is it a straight lease with an option to purchase? Is it an improper installment purchase? Um, we need to figure out that structure, and that's where hopefully the, the, you know, the attorney that you're working with will, will be able to help you um, analyze that and figure out just whether or not there's some aspects of the agreement that are not going to fit within your authorities. Um, you need to look at what funds you can use to make the payments. Um, and, and that's going to be something that you're going to need to be analyzing uh, on more than a short-term basis, but a long-term basis. One of the advantages of, uh, of investing in the solar equipment is that you have just used, if you're going to buy the equipment and install the equipment and, buy, and pay for it up front, you have just used your PEPL money or your sales tax money, uh, and you have lessened the burden on your general fund. 
because now your power uh, consumption that you buy from your utility is going to be a heck of a lot less. Uh, so does that make sense uh, to you? It's not just what funds can we legally use, but how do we? How does that fit within our our long term plans and, and and our abilities to use our funds over time? Um, look for those indefinite costs uh, in the agreement, um, such things as maintenance. Um, um, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm not able to see all my screen here. Um, um, the what happens if you underproduce your power? Uh, are, are you obliged then to go back and make the, uh, the purchase of the power from your utilities so that you've just made a lease payment out of your PEPL fund and for equipment that's not producing power and you've also are, are making payment for the power out of your general fund? Look, look for those kind of uh, terms in the agreement to, to figure out if there's something that needs to be changed. Uh, look at the, the potential for competitive bids. Um, are we buying the equipment and will the equipment be installed as part of that purchase? Then you are probably going to be uh, in a competitive bid area. Also, look at competitive bidding not from just what is required by uh, the Iowa Code for public improvements, but what also may be required by policy. Uh, we see this coming up with uh, purchase of our equipment, uh, our technology equipment. Say if you're in a district with a one-to-one -one, uh, um, laptop uh, initiative, uh, laptops are not public construction. That, that's not covered by competitive bid laws, but a lot of districts have policies that say before we sign a contract for goods or services over $50,000, the district will be seeking competitive bid, sealed uh, competitive proposals on it. So if you have that policy in place, even though the competitive bid law doesn't uh, uh, come into play, and even though you're, uh, um, you may not be buying an installed equipment, but maybe buying power services, you might have to uh, follow that policy or at least have the policy waived by the board before you enter into the contract. So in the end, what, what should you be looking at? It doesn't make financial sense. Look at your utility payments. Um, look at what you're going to save. Look at the advantage of shifting costs to other funds. Um, compare what it is that you're, uh, is being proposed to you uh, with the possibility of borrowing, uh, if you have that borrowing available to you. So if, uh, if you're looking at signing an agreement that provides for payments for five years and then a balloon payment at the end, maybe it would make more financial sense if you have the authority to just, the, op, uh, the option to just buy the equipment right now uh, up front uh, using Pebbler sales tax, maybe that makes more sense. Take the time to analyze it to, do, uh, to determine what makes the best sense. And finally, what am I not addressing? That's what, uh, what came up in one of these uh, um, um, questions, the solar tax credit issue. I'm not addressing that. I'm not an expert on that. I have looked at it a little bit, but schools don't take those credits. It may be that you, the, the entities that you're uh, working with are looking at taking advantage of the credits. Those entities should be looking very carefully at the rules that, that, that require um, them to be the, the, the beneficial users of the equipment in order to, uh, to take the credit. But that is not an issue for the district. Um, it should be a, a, something that's left on them to, uh, to, to figure out and to take on as their own risk. So you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't take on any responsibility for that. Um, were there, is there any? Oops. We're near the end here. I want to look back and see where we are on questions. Um, okay. Oops. Somebody has another resource for. Okay. We've got a question here. Another resource for school solar information, including feasibility and bud budgeting, would be Energy Association of Iowa Schools. 
The number is 641-202-0949. So there you go. <laughs> that's, uh, that's more information that's been shared with us today for the benefit of the group. Um, that's what I have here for you today. We are right at an hour, so I'll turn it back to Sure. Thank, Patty. thank you very much, Ron. This is a complex situation. There is no doubt about it. And I think Ron is right. Number one, when, you, when you're approached by this or want to enter into it, really seek out your uh, legal counsel and, and have them go step by step with you through the process. We hope that this has helped you today. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us or your own legal counsel. And uh, certainly the answers can be had. Thanks once again for participating in this webinar. And again, it will be posted on our homepage shortly afterwards. Thanks again.